Hey, Happy Friday. This week, we learned that MediaTek will reportedly release a new chip with an NVIDIA GPU. Oppo has just announced that it gave up on making chips. And believe it or not, I'm in Syria. So I will also talk about what the technology landscape is like here. I have pretty limited upload speeds, so you'll have to do without a video of me and without the podcast this week as well. But anyway, welcome to a very special episode of the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by NordVPN, without which this episode would have been quite difficult to make. Okay, this week we'll start the brief with the news that HTC is back, sort of, with a new phone called the U23 Pro 5G. It has a 120Hz OLED screen, a Snapdragon 7 Gen 1, and a headphone jack, believe it or not, plus a connection to HTC's Viveverse with a dedicated app. Next, Nothing announced that the Nothing Phone 2 will use the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 processor, and as a little heads up, I'll be going to visit Nothing in London at the end of the month to make an exclusive video about them, so stay tuned for more. Anyway, also this week, Logitech partnered with iFixit to offer self-repairs for select hardware with spare parts, batteries, and repair guides starting with its MX Master and MX Anywhere mice. I really like this trend. And next, earlier this week, Montana became the first US state to ban TikTok starting on the 1st of January 2024 by not allowing the company ByteDance to operate there. That's right, you'll get state-level bans on consumer apps in the US now, which is totally going to be really fun and really easy to enforce, I guess. There is a $10,000 fine per day for violations for ByteDance if it doesn't comply, and app stores will be held responsible too as well. The ban will almost certainly certainly still go to court, and Motana is also rolling out bans for apps like WeChat, Timu, and even Telegram, although those are supposedly only banned from government-issued devices. Next, India has launched a $2 billion incentive scheme to entice makers of laptops, tablets, and other hardware to the country. This follows a pretty successful smartphone program that the country launched a few years ago, where now around 97% of phones are made, or at least assembled, domestically, and India is definitely aiming to absorb the electronics manufacturing that China is losing. Next, Apple announced Personal Voice this week, which is a new technology that can apparently replicate your own voice after training it on just 15 minutes of audio, with the idea being to help you if you're starting to lose your ability to speak, so you can do this to preserve a digital copy of your voice, which you can then use by typing. Very cool. Also this week, Google announced that it will change its policy, saying that accounts that were inactive for at least two years will now be deleted, except for those with YouTube videos connected to them. So if you haven't logged into one of your accounts in a while, you might want to do that soon. And finally, for the brief, Samsung's own TV division will, for the first time ever, apparently buy high-end OLED panels from LG for its large TV sizes, which will make for a rather awkward alliance. Okay, that's it for the brief, and my first story of the week is a report from DigiTimes that pretty strongly claims that MediaTek and Nvidia are teaming up for a next-generation smartphone chip that will see a flagship MediaTek chip with an integrated Nvidia GPU as early as 2024. I guess this could very well be part of the next premium Dimensity chipsets, and the report matches with previous rumors from a few months ago that claimed that Nvidia would also include Nvidia-made AI chips into their phone SoCs as well. I'm really curious to see how Nvidia's GPU tech translates to Android, how features like DLSS and AI elements are going to get carried over with driver support and so on, and with Samsung's comeback with AMD's Radeon unit expected with the next generation as well, it seems like we might get a proper big red versus big green battle in mobile SoCs. In the past, MediaTek just used the standard GPU design from ARM, but we have seen some Chromebooks that had Media tech chips paired with Nvidia GeForce GPUs in the past, so the two companies are clearly playing at least a little bit of buddy-buddy. And very interestingly, this new combination is also set to be coming to PCs, including Windows on ARM, which could be a huge deal for competition in notebooks. 
Okay, and my second story of the week is also chip news, but this time sad stuff. Oppo apparently nuked its entire chip division called Zeku. It just completely gave up. Zeku was a relatively new division that has so far made things like Mari Silicon coprocessors for image processing, audio processing, and so on, with a complete smartphone SoC rumored to be in the works as well, but all new development has now been shut down and all that stuff will never come. The group will apparently be laying off nearly 3,000 employees, which means that this was a huge strategic bet from the company, and this part of the company had about 200 patents in its Shanghai division alone. Oppo blamed the shutdown on uncertainties in the global economy and in the smartphone industry, and indeed the company's shipments have declined this year, but the BBK group that Oppo is a part of is still the largest phone conglomerate in the world, so I'm sure that they could have kept on going if they thought they had a good chance. Anyway, maybe Oppo is scaling back on risky projects, which would mean that others, like maybe the air glass concepts, might get axed too, or maybe Oppo just found out, like almost everyone else, that making chips is just really, really hard. LG and Xiaomi both tried and failed, Samsung has been flip-flopping around for a long time, and Google is basically just repackaging Exynos chips with a few changes as well, so I guess it can't be easy to make something competitive. Okay, and for my third story of the week, I thought that since I am in Syria, which is a pretty unique thing, I'll give you an unusual update explaining what the pretty unique situation with phones, internet, and electricity is here in Damascus. Oh, and I don't have a ton of bandwidth to upload a lot of videos, so please bear with me as I use mostly photos. So I'm in a country for a family visit that would take just way too long to explain, and I found a few really interesting things. First, there is a general shortage of gas in the country, which powers the electrical grid. So each district, at least here in Damascus, is rationed to only getting electricity once every five hours for a single hour. And then after that, there is a local blackout. At least the phone networks usually stay on during this time, and mobile data usually holds up okay too. But because of the constant outages, a ton of apartment buildings, including ours, have solar panels on top of them, which are not feeding into the grid, but are directly powering appliances like like our fridge, a few lights, etc., while they also quickly charge as many batteries as possible. So that's electricity, and next we come to phones. Surprisingly, to me, just about any phone brand seems to be roughly available here, as they are all imported either officially or through back channels with markups, but you do have to pay a pretty crazy 60% of the value of a phone in tax if you put a SIM card into it. That is obviously a ton of money, so of course locals figured out that you could just have two phones, one cheap one with a SIM card and maybe a hotspot, and a nicer smartphone that is mainly only using Wi-Fi. And talking of Wi-Fi, it is a bit unreliable with the routers losing power pretty often, and speeds are not great either, with our apartment getting about 3 to 4 megabits down, less than 1 megabit up, with a ping of about 100 in Damascus on a good day, but at least it does work, I guess. The Syrian government of course blocks a bunch of websites that they don't like, but I've actually had more trouble because of US sanctions, which don't allow many foreign companies to provide foreign services in the country. For example, our internal chat tool, Slack, just refuses to load, citing sanctions. The OneDrive app simply crashes on my phone as soon as it detects that it is in Syria. And companies like Google aren't allowed to process payments, so the Google Play Store only offers free apps, YouTube doesn't allow for monetization, etc., which makes it harder for people to make money online. Still, as always, people seem to live on and find creative solutions around problems. And one great solution to internet problems is NordVPN, which instantly unlocks access to most of the global internet, while also keeping your traffic encrypted so your network operator can't see which sites you are visiting. I will not say whether I did or did not use Nord in Syria, since I can't confidently claim that VPNs are legal here, but let's just say that it is generally a great tool and that it has helped me in many countries with my research and and with my entertainment as well. Nord is the fastest VPN on the market according to independent speed tests, it connected flawlessly from all countries that I've tried it from, and performance is so fast that I basically couldn't even notice it being on. Nord is also secure with a strict no locks policy, so even they don't keep records of where you've been, and to back up their claims, Nord has lately even started open sourcing big parts of their software, so developers can poke around in it and check if all is good. 
A Nord account covers six different devices, including even your router if you want to, so it can cover a whole family. And if you use my link, nordvpn.com slash Friday Checkout, which you can also find in the description, you will actually get four extra months with a two year plan. That's a pretty good deal, four extra months. And there's also a 30 day money back guarantee if you don't like the service. So there's basically no risk in giving it a try. So check it out with the link in the description and I'll see you in the next video.